hi everybody and thank you for coming. It's really great to be here again. I haven't been here for a few years and, uh, and it's wonderful for me even though there are many people that I don't know personally, they come to visit me either at the booth or just like the, the one woman who came to talk to me now, they come to these lectures every year and so I feel I have this bit of an extended family when I come here and it's, it's lovely. Um, so as I was introduced, I've uh, been practicing as a naturopathic doctor for many years. My specialty is women's health and the mind-body connection. I've been teaching um, women about breast health for the last 30 years, traveling to about 15 different countries, educating women on ways to reduce the risk of breast cancer. And uh, I'm just really honored to be able to do this work. I thought that we would, um, I'd start by, by just asking you if you have any specific questions so that as, uh, as I talk, I can answer your questions. So anybody have a specific question that you'd like me to answer in the next hour? Yes. Absolutely. So the Healthy Breast Program, so the question was, if something's been identified but it's stable regarding breast health, does this program still apply? And absolutely. So the Healthy Breast Program is both a prevention program as well as a preventing the risk of recurrence program as well as just maintain the best breast health you can program. So from every perspective. And it's not just a breast program, it's really an all-round longevity program. It would apply to men as well for the most part. It applies to heart disease, it applies to arthritis. The same program would be useful for all of those conditions. Okay. Uh, one of my um, reasons for creating this was recognition many years ago that, uh, that there, there, you know, there certainly is a breast cancer epidemic and there was very little that was being done to teach women how to be proactive in reducing the risk of this disease. And when I became informed uh, about how many environmental links especially there were to breast cancer many decades ago, I became upset and angry and thought, how come nobody is telling anybody about this? And so I've been sort of on this bandwagon for a long time and my my um, vision or my passion is, is if we're not able to educate women and women to help other women, then in a few generations, every woman will have breast cancer at some point in her life, you know, and that's what I see. And so I says, I got to do something. We have to do something. And so that's what the Healthy Breast Program is about, is about educating women to sort of prevent this, not only in our own lives, but in future generations. And it's, I think it's our responsibility to do it. So thank you for that. Any other questions? Yes. What was the question about breast massage? Yes. Yeah, I can certainly share that. Thank you. Okay. So this topic is um, supposed to be about the sort of top 10 tips for women's health, things that you can do to take care of your well-being and your whole body health. And I've gone through, uh, I mean, there's many, many things that we can do with exercise and diet and supplements, and it, those are all wonderful. But probably, I think the most important thing is that we have a deep connection with ourselves and a deep connection with our body, uh, that we appreciate and know who we are, that we accept all parts of ourselves, that we accept our body as it is right now, and that we learn to live with, um, we learn to acknowledge also our emotional reality, whatever that is, instead of pushing it down or suppressing it or pretending it doesn't exist, and, uh, and develop an authentic life. And that's a tall order because many of us have been, uh, since early childhood, adopted certain coping mechanisms like being very nice or being pretty, or being good, or being kind, or being an achiever, or being a perfectionist. We adopt these coping mechanisms 
to uh, maintain a connection with our parents and with society, with our families, and we start to, and we're not, not even aware that it's happening, we start to become somebody other than who we really are inside. How many of you are familiar with that? And then one day we wake up and we say, how did I get here? What happened to my own self-care? Whose life am I living anyhow? Right? And so I think what is absolutely essential is to have some sort of practice, whether it's journaling or walking in the woods or meditation or, or dance, some way that we really connect deeply with ourselves on a daily basis to sort of see what's going on inside and pay attention to that, honor it, and then speak up with what it is we need to say or do to maintain that um, connection with ourselves, to, to be living the life that we really want to live. And I know today is Remembrance Day, and today, earlier today at 11 o'clock, we had a minute of silence in the Whole Life Expo where we remembered those people who have died in the wars. And this, this little segment I'm going to do now, I would suggest, is also remembrance for these women especially who have died of breast cancer. And I'm, how many of you know somebody who's died of breast cancer? Raise your hands if you know somebody who's died of breast cancer. So half the people in the room know somebody who's died of breast cancer. Because in a way, it's another, um, uh, in a way, that's a kind of another war, isn't it? It's kind of another battle. It's kind of another uh, death toll. It's huge. It's a huge death toll, actually. And we're all in this together. We're a species that's trying to um, maintain our viability on this planet as we simultaneously destroy it. And how many of you would agree with that? We're destroying the earth and we're trying to, re <laughs> it's peculiar, isn't it? We're trying to preserve our lives at the same time as we destroy the earth. What's the stupidity of that, isn't it? But it's the reality of what's happening. And so the whole disease of breast cancer is like a huge wake-up call for us to see what's going on, that one in eight women in Canada would have breast cancer. That this year alone, you know, this year alone on the planet, 2.1 million women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. If 2.1 million women suddenly died in a huge accident, would we pay attention? If 2.1 million women are dying, are not dying, not dying, but being diagnosed from breast cancer, why aren't we paying more attention to do something about it? That's peculiar, isn't it? Why isn't there like teaching in grade school about what to do to prevent this disease? So we're, we're like living in denial about what's going on around us. And it's not just breast cancer, it's also thyroid problems. Thyroid pro program, problems go along with breast problems. And so, in order for us to sort of wake up and comprehend what's going on and not be asleep to it, we need to have this time every day to check in with ourselves, okay? So I'm going to suggest this little exercise and invite you to do it if you feel comfortable doing it. It's just basically an exercise of going into the body and seeing what's there. So I'll ask you to sit quietly and comfortably. If it feels better with legs crossed, that's fine. If you f feel better with your feet flat on the floor, you might be a little bit more grounded. Be comfortable. Some of you might want to sit with a very straight spine. If that doesn't feel right, then don't, you know? But anyhow, be alert. Stay in this alert posture. And in this alertness, I want you to imagine that you have the lens, you're seeing and feeling through the lens of a compassionate female presence, almost like a universal mother. And there's so much nurturing and so much love and so much acceptance from this universal mother that it's, it almost makes you cry. And now go into the body, bring this presence of the universal mother into the body and just observe what you feel, what you sense, what arises in terms of a gentle sensation or a feeling or an emotional feeling and bring your attention to it. 
as though this, this universal mother in you is sort of just watching, observing with kindness whatever is going on inside the body. Do this for maybe two more minutes. S simply notice the sensations, notice what arises, and give it loving attention. There may be some discomfort, there may be some pain, maybe a beautiful feeling, whatever it is, allow it to be as it is. You may find that your breathing slows down. Allow it to slow down and take this kindness inside your body. What does your body want to show you that maybe you don't look at or sense? Where is the tension? Where is the pressure? Where is the opening? Or where is the constriction? And allow yourself to feel, whatever it is, allow yourself to feel, it's okay. Stay present with your breath as a stabilizing force. And just see what's there, feel what's there. And trust that there's a wisdom in the body. And the body's always talking to us, wanting to show us something. And either we ignore it or we pay attention. So this is a moment of paying attention. Now gently breathe in. And breathe out. And when you're ready, open your eyes. How many people experienced something uncomfortable? Let's raise your hands if you there's something uncomfortable. Thank you. How many people experienced something pleasant, really pleasant? Okay, great. So it can be either way, pleasant, unpleasant, and it doesn't matter. Uh, it's important that we give it space. And as we give that space, things shift, and, uh, and that's paying attention to the body, that's making the connection with ourselves. So that would be my first tip for you, is connect with yourselves, because we spend a lot of our, our time running away from ourselves, running away from our emotions, using distractions, getting busy, suppressing what we don't want to feel, using addiction, etc. So if we're going to get through all that, we have to come back to ourselves and see what's there and allow it to be as it, as it is and then take whatever steps we need to do to change our circumstances if, it, if there's something we want to change. So that would be tip number one. If I was to go with the next um, tip, it would be to learn to really express your emotions, honestly. To be able to say, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling afraid, I'm feeling happy, I love you, you know? Whatever it is, to be able to express our emotions. Because the emotions are what we suppress, again, as children. We suppress, often we can't express those emotions when we're children and something bad happens to us or something doesn't happen to us that should happen to us, we learn not to express our emotions. How many of you can relate to that? 
At some point, we learn not to express our emotions. And then, and then it's scary then, right? It's scary later on in life if we feel something, but we're afraid. I can't say that right now. They won't like me, or they'll reject me, or they'll abandon me. So we learn to deny our truth, to maintain some connection with somebody, but it means we're living a lie. And the body is very smart. The body knows when we're living a lie. So every disease that we have, every, every, 100%, every illness that we have, whether it's a headache or breast cancer or arthritis, is a communication from the body for us to come back to our, ourselves and to express what we need to express. It's not that uh, those symptoms cannot also be related to many other things, but there's always an mental, emotional component. Okay? So we want to have this dialogue with the body to figure out what that is and what emotion was suppressed and what's our truth and what do we need to say. So we, tip number two, be authentic with your emotions. Learn how to express them in a compassionate way where you're 100% authentic with yourself. How many of you feel you can do that already? Good. Well done. <laughs> and we can probably all get better at it, right? And the third thing now would be um, if I move away from the psychological and the, the spiritual and we move towards the physical, probably the first, the, the next physical tip would be to get at least 40 minutes of exercise a day. Um, so 40 minutes is sort of the minimum that we need, and this could be walking, it could be jogging, it could be swimming, it could be dancing, but 40 minutes of exercise above and beyond what you usually do in your home or your work. And that does a number of things. It helps to uh, balance insulin, so you're much, much less likely to have diabetes, and your insulin levels will be lower. Those lower insulin levels also protect you from cancers, especially breast cancer. If insulin is higher, there's a threefold increased risk of breast cancer. So blood sugar is a really important thing. That exercise will help your body to metabolize estrogen, for example, more quickly. So your estrogen levels will be lower, which protects you from ovarian cysts, uterine cancer, uterine fibroids, breast cancer, breast lumps, if we can get our estrogen levels down a little bit. Uh, that exercise improves the blood circulation and the lymphatic circulation, so your whole body is going to get more nutrients, more oxygen, and will clean itself better. Okay? So the exercise is huge in terms of, and we know for longevity as well, right? In terms of what increases lifespan and what uh, prevents diseases like Alzheimer's, main thing is exercise. You can take all the supplements you want, but if you don't exercise, your brain cells uh, become less resilient and more diseased. And so in order to maintain an exercise routine for one's life, it has to be a routine, something you can do every day, and ideally something you enjoy, right? Something you enjoy. So that's what I would suggest. Find something you really love, and uh, it has to be affordable. So it could be walking, right? <laughs> That's pretty simple. And the third tip would be around sleep. So we also know that we need eight hours of sleep, or seven to eight hours sleep, seven to nine hours sleep, I would say, but no, no less than seven uh, for longevity and to um, keep our cortisol levels normal. So that's another hormone that can get out of balance uh, quite easily when we're stressed or if there's lack of sleep, is the cortisol is an adrenal hormone that helps you adapt to stress. And many of us, it's either too high or too low. And if you have insomnia or aren't sleeping well enough, your cortisol is likely going to be going up or down to help you adapt to stress. And that imbalance in cortisol causes an imbalance in many other hormones. So if your cortisol is high, insulin goes up, and then you're more likely to have diabetes. Uh, if your cortisol is high or low, it's going to impact your thyroid, right? So we have to balance the adrenal glands and the cortisol. If your cortisol is high, 
your memory function goes down. Okay? So high cortisol, lots of stress, you stop remembering things. So we, and sleep would be one of the factors that helps to balance the adrenal glands. Let me talk a bit more about sleep and then we'll talk about other ways to balance the adrenal glands. The adrenals is really the kingpin of the glandular system. It's kind of, we want to fix that one before all the other ones. Uh, sleep also um, helps with melatonin. So melatonin is a hormone produced between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the morning by your pineal gland. You need to be sleeping in a dark room to make melatonin. So if you have street lights shining through your room or if you have a light in your hallway and it's shining into your bedroom, it's likely that your melatonin levels will be lower, which puts you at risk of um, cancers as well as um, disruptions in your biological rhythms. So you might have um, disruptions in when you're hungry, when you're not hungry. Your moods will be a little bit more erratic uh, if your melatonin levels are low. So this is a big problem for shift workers, right? So shift workers, nurses, airline stewardesses, for example, have more cancers, especially breast cancer, than other women. So we want to try to do our best to uh, deal with that, like somebody has to work the night shift. So those women might want to take melatonin, at least on the nights that they're not working. And it possibly they can, get, they can take maybe one milligram of melatonin and see if they can still stay awake those nights that they are working. The usual dose is three, three milligrams of melatonin at about 10 o'clock at night. It has to be taken before bed. You can also double or triple your melatonin levels if you meditate before bed or if you pray before bed. So that would be part of the sleep routine, is spend 11 minutes before bed, either in prayer or meditation. One of the easiest meditations that will increase or improve your sleep is left nostril breathing. Does anyone already do that before bed, left nostril breathing? Okay, so anytime you need to relax, or you're, you're panicking, you're anxious, or you can't sleep, you can just block the right nostril like this with your thumb, and begin slow, long, deep breathing through the left nostril only. Let's do this for one minute. So inhale through the left nostril and first fill the belly. Keep inhaling and now expand into the chest. Keep inhaling a little bit more. Expand all the way up to your collarbones. And then exhale in reverse through the left nostril. First from the upper chest, then from the chest. Then pull your navel in towards your spine as you complete the exhale. Let's do three more of these. Inhale, expand your belly. Keep expanding your chest. Keep expanding all the way up to your collarbones, left nostril. And exhale from the top down. Slow it down. And pull your navel in towards your spine as you complete the exhale. And one more. Do it on your own. Really, really slow. Belly chest, upper chest, exhale, in reverse. Left nostril breathing increases the function of your parasympathetic nervous system, primarily governed by the vagus nerve. And when you activate the parasympathetic nervous system, the body relaxes, healing is stimulated, and sleep improves. If you, how many of you have anxiety? If you do this 11 minutes a day and you slow your breath down to less than four breaths per minute while you're doing it, you will dramatically de decrease your anxiety, okay? So four breaths per minute, that's sort of eight counts on the inhale, eight counts on the exhale, 11 minutes a day, especially before bed because that'll help you sleep as well, then you can decrease anxiety. And while you're doing this breathing, instead of thinking about all the things you have to do the next day or planning dinner or whatever it is, you focus on breathing. So your concentration is on the body, on the belly, on the chest. Your concentration is on feeling the air going in and out of your nostrils. Okay, so you're not doing it mindlessly, you're doing it with attention on the act of breathing. We got it? Yes. Uh, so right now, everyone, block one nostril, breathe through the other. 
and then switch. And how many of you notice that the left nostril is more dominant? You can get more air through the left nostril than the right. Raise your hands if you can. About half. How many of you notice that the right nostril is more dominant? Fewer. How many feel that they're completely equal? You do. Okay, good. So uh, this is what happens. This is called the nasal cycle. And it's a rhythm that happens many times, several times in 24 hours. It's called an ultradian rhythm. So one nostril will be dominant for 60 to 90 minutes. Then they'll both be open for about 20 minutes. And the other nostril is dominant for 60 to 90 minutes. And so this is about a two and a half hour cycle, okay, that happens throughout the day and the night. And when your right nostril is dominant, your sympathetic nervous system is more active and the left hemisphere of the brain is more active. So you're in logical mode and let's get this done, push mode. Okay, so you, when your right nostril is dominant, you, your math quizzes are better and you can get, you have more activity to get things done. And, it's, and when your left nostril is dominant, it's the opposite. Right hemisphere is dominant, you're more relaxed, you're better at writing poetry or painting a picture or sitting and having a cup of tea, etc. Okay, it's just a natural rhythm that coordinates the hemispheres of the brain in terms of which one has a little bit more activity and circulation, as well as uh, the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system. That's right. And if you're going to have a fight with your partner, right nostril breathing. Okay. Um, and you want to win the fight. If you, if you want a, a resolution to the fight, it would be left nostril breathing. If you want to win the argument, it would be right nostril breathing. So, so that's how it works. And so it's the body's built-in um, balancer of the, of the autonomic nervous system. Now, so if, let's say we looked at eight in the morning to eight at night, and we said this is a two and a half hour cycle. It means, that about, there's about five of those, let's see, five of those, two and a half times five is what, 12 hours? Yeah. So there's about five of those cycles in a 12 hour period. That period when both nostrils are open is 20 minutes, is a time of integration. Integration between the hemispheres, integration between the sides of the body, and you're more connected with your intuition at that time. So it means, ideally, that if we were really in touch with our bodies and ourselves, Every two and a half hours, we would stop and make that connection and either do a breathing exercise, have a nap, have a cup of tea and do nothing, journal. You know, it's a time for us to check in every two and a half hours and, and kind of allow that integration period and, and connection to our whole selves. Does that make sense? So that's another, I'd say that's another tip, is take these little 20-minute relaxation breaks during the day and in terms of looking at people with chronic disease and what helps them to heal, and looking at the function of your adrenal glands, how many of you feel a little burnt out? Do you feel burnt out? Best thing for your adrenal glands, actually stop five times a day and have a nap. <laughs> That's what your body is saying you need. But we override it. This, this culture overrides it, right? Consumerism is more, everything is more. Do more, do more. How can we cut our costs, make women work more, you know? That's, what this, that's what's driving this culture, but it's killing us also as women and, and impacting our children because we're asked to do too much. So as best you can, build into your daily structure these 20-minute breaks. If it's one, great. If it's five, fantastic. And when you look at certain cultures, like the Muslim culture, what do they do? They pray five times a day. So certain cultures have this rhythm built into the culture. It would be great if we did too in whatever way works for you, okay? Whatever, we, whatever way works for you. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary. So the other thing about sleep is if you have trouble sleeping, take 800 milligrams of magnesium glycinate before bed. Okay? So you could take the melatonin, you could do the breathing exercise, you could take the magnesium. 
That would be low melatonin quite often, or it could be your blood sugar could be low. If it's between 1 and 3 in the morning, uh, or 11 and 1, it can be liver. So then you want to take care of your liver, right? So there's various reasons why that might happen at a certain time. But usually the magnesium helps a lot, and the breathing before bed helps a lot. It also could be that your cortisol is high at night. So the, because cortisol keeps you awake. So the adrenal hormone. If someone's under a lot of stress, cortisol might be too high, and it wakes them up, they have insomnia. So you've got to figure out what the cause is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Try the magnesium first and do the breathing exercise before bed. And when you wake up, do the breathing exercise again, okay? And see if that, over time, that probably will help to reset it. And make sure you've got a dark room. Mask if you want, okay. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so some people have the opposite effect with melatonin. That's what's happening with you, so it's not going to work for you. Yeah, so take more magnesium instead of the melatonin. Yes? Okay, thank you. So that's a, that's a possibility too, that you just need to get used to it, so try it for a week and see if your body gets used to it. But thanks for these, yes? Moonlight is what you do want, because our whole uh, menstrual cycle and hormonal cycle is also regulated by the moon. So if you have a completely dark room, open the blinds the day before the day of, the day after the full moon. And it's that light of the moon that actually sets um, the menstrual cycle through the function of the hypothalamus and the pineal gland on the other glandulars, on the other glands, okay? So you do, and if you don't, if you don't have a window, then just put a night light on those three days. And women who have an irregular menstrual cycle, that's sometimes enough to set it, okay? We want to be living in, with nature more, right? So we need that moonlight to stabilize that big rhythm of the menstrual cycle. Street lights, yeah, the street lights, absolutely. The, the, you want the equivalent of the moonlight and the starlight, but nothing more than that. And that's what your body, I mean, you probably notice it, I certainly notice it. When there's a full moon, I live in the country, there's just the moon and the stars. When, the, when there's a full moon, I'm more awake at night, you know, because of the light of the moon, and that, that's the effect on melatonin. Melatonin goes down with light. Melatonin goes up with dark. So you sleep in a dark room, you have more melatonin, so you sleep better. You've got light in your room, less melatonin, you won't sleep so good. When the moonlight. Yeah. Yeah, and that would be, yeah, that would be the melatonin goes down, the more light goes up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you, if you want to sleep more, then have a darker room. Yeah. Or get the mask, right? Yeah, get the mask. Yes. I, I couldn't hear that. Something about sleeping in a dark room, but speak a little louder. Oh, you don't have to sleep in a dark room. It still can mean that your melatonin levels, um, you know, we want, to, we want to optimize melatonin. Even though you can sleep fine if the room's not dark, your melatonin is not going to be optimal. Because melatonin drops as soon as you turn on a light. Okay? And that's, melatonin protects against breast cancer. And protects, it, melatonin helps to decrease the effects of estrogen. Because melatonin decreases the number of estrogen receptors. Melatonin enhances your immune system. Melatonin increases longevity. Does a lot of things. Regulates all of your rhythms. We want to optimize melatonin. Okay, it's an anti-aging hormone. Okay, any other questions about sleep before we move on? Yes. Yeah, my question is, um, what magnesium do to our body while uh, sleep for sleeping? Magnesium glycinate or bisglycinate. Usually you don't have diarrhea with that magnesium. That's why too. 
And glycine uh, is a natural, it relaxes the body too. So are we going to take both the body? No, one or the other. One. Either glycinate or bisglycinate, one or the other, 800 milligrams. Okay, before bed. Yes. No, melatonin, some people think if they take melatonin that your pineal gland stops making melatonin. That's not the case because uh, the way the pineal works, it gets a signal from the hypothalamus when, it, when it's light or dark to either make more melatonin or not make melatonin, but there's not a feedback loop the way there is with the other glands and the pituitary gland. So it's totally based on light and dark and it's still going to make it if it's light and dark because there's not a feedback loop. Okay? Great. Um, okay, let's go to, I think we're on, are we on three or four? Sleep? Five. Okay, what would the next one be? Um, I think the next one would be to have a plant-based diet. Primarily, not maybe, if you, if you feel like your body type needs some animal protein, fine. But um, I th personally, I know some of you may be on ketogenic diets or paleo diets, and with all due respect, I think that the, the healthiest diet for longevity and anti-cancer is a low glycemic uh, vegetarian or vegan diet. And you would need supplementation then for your B12, your zinc, and your iron, quite possibly, on that kind of a diet. But if you look at the blue zones, places around the world where people live to be 100 or more, that's the diet they have. They're not heavy meat eaters. There's mostly beans. Beans and vegetables and whole grains and fruits and herbs, you know? Yes. Well, meat is high in uric acid. Oh yeah, meat is much higher in uric acid than the beans. So we have to have some protein. So your protein as a vegetarian, and how much do you need? About 40 grams a day. So 40 grams of protein a day as a vegetarian. Our choices are legumes, organic soy, which is very protective despite what many people think. It's, it's, it's protective unless you have an autoimmune thyroid disease. It's not. It's not. I, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. That's, that's um, misinformation. Okay? Um, your other protein sources, so there's the legumes, the organic soy, uh, mushrooms actually have a fair amount of protein, pumpkin seeds have a fair amount of protein, hemp seeds have a fair amount of protein, nuts have a little bit of protein. Okay? So, so we have to get our vegetarian protein from those sources. 40 grams a day, what does that look like? Uh, one cup of beans, one glass of soy milk, and maybe two tablespoons of either hemp seeds or flax seeds or pumpkin seeds. It's not that much, you know, but you gotta kind of make that work. Now the issue uh, around soy, so for example, there was a study of 5,000 women in China and they, who had breast cancer. They'd had breast cancer once, and they gave those women either uh, 11 grams of soy a day, or soy plus tamoxifen, which is a drug used against breast cancer, or tamoxifen by itself, or nothing. And they found that the women who had the most soy did better than all the other groups. So the soy worked better than tamoxifen, and the soy alone worked better than tamoxifen plus soy. So this is why, is that any hormone like estrogen or insulin or whatever the hormone is, doesn't do anything until it attaches to a receptor. So you can have really high amounts of estrogen, but it also depends on how many receptors for estrogen you have, got it? The hormone attaches to the receptor, like this. So all breast cells and bone cells and skin cells and brain cells, and other cells have receptors for estrogen because estrogen needs to act on those parts of the body. Your ovaries, your uterus have receptors for estrogen. So then the estrogen is carried in your bloodstream and it attaches to those receptors and then one of the things estrogen does is it causes the cells to multiply faster. We got that so far? 
So, so just, just a second. So then if, if we want to decrease estrogen to decrease breast cancer, what are we going to do? Because the body is making these estrogens, we're getting them from the environment as well, we're getting them from meat and dairy and eggs, we're getting the estrogen from there. Well, what you want is you want a weak estrogen that attaches to the same receptor, but blocks the body's strong estrogens and blocks the environmental estrogens. Does that make sense? So the soy and the flax seeds and the pumpkin seeds and the mung bean sprouts and red clover sprouts are the best phytoestrogens that are weak, but they plug up those receptors. So the environmental estrogens like the plastics and the pesticides can't attach, and your body's strong estrogens, estradiol and estrone, and C2 hydroxystrone, sorry, the C4 and the C16 hydroxystrone, those are all the potentially harmful estrogens. So they can't attach to the receptor. So how much do you need? You need 11 grams of soy a day. Unless you have autoimmune thyroid disease like Hashimoto's, then you don't use it. Uh, and you need, let's say, two tablespoons of the ground flaxseed every day. And maybe two tablespoons of pumpkin seed powder. I really like the Styrian Gold pumpkin seed powder, S-T-Y-R-I-A-N. It's fantastic. It's really high in magnesium. And, and then maybe um, mung bean sprouts and red clover sprouts, if that works for you. Does that make sense? Pumpkin oil doesn't have the phytoestrogens. You need the, the fiber, you need the flax seeds, not the oil. The oil is also good, but not for this. Okay? So the, the misinformation around soy is that it somehow increases breast cancer because it's estrogenic. It decreases breast cancer because it's a weak estrogen that attaches to the receptor and blocks the strong estrogens. Okay? And there was another study in California, 1,000 women, same kind of thing, found the same results. So the soy decreases breast cancer and breast cancer recurrence by about 30%. It's better than any drug. It's huge. So if you've had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, you do want to have that organic tofu, organic edamame, organic tempeh, organic soy milk, 11 grams a day, unless you have an allergy to it or you have an autoimmune thyroid disease. Okay? Now the soy uh, does have, as do the beans, phytic acid. And so some people say, oh, okay, it's going to block my minerals because it has phytic acid. And that, I've never found that to be the case, really. But you can use, um, take in a little bit of extra iodine. So either dulse powder, nori sheets, kelp powder, something, because the soy can block the thyroid picking up iodine. So to protect the thyroid, use some seaweed in your diet. Iodine is very good for the ovaries and the breasts and the thyroid, unless you have an overactive thyroid. Most of us don't get enough in this part of the world because we're not beside the sea, right? And we don't really want to eat fish because it's contaminated with um, PCBs and dioxin and mercury. So the place to get the iodine is from the seaweeds. And some people say, well, aren't the seaweeds contaminated? not nearly as much as the fish because they don't have a lot of fat in them. So the toxins tend to uh, accumulate in fatty tissue. And I think the seaweeds are more beneficial than possibly harmful. Yes? What is iodine salt? Iodine salt, if, if you can, uh, you st that iodine is good in it. As long as, um, I think sea salt would be better. You know, just a natural sea salt. Yeah. They add iodine to sea salt, or it's just naturally iodized with the iodine? On that product, that's what is the yeah. of the I don't know. I don't know anything about it. But, but anyhow, we need iodine in our diets. And if you have high blood pressure, you wouldn't have the salt. If you don't have high blood pressure, you can have the salt, a little bit of salt, just a little bit of salt, you know. Otherwise, use the seaweeds. I, I, we use dulse powder in my home. We just shake dulse powder on our food. And I use nori sheets and put avocado and brown rice and stuff in nori sheets. So just figure out a way that you can use the, the seaweed. So the seaweed is very good for women's health in general. And if you look at Japan, Japan has a relatively low amount of breast cancer. So does China, relatively speaking. They, they eat lots of tofu, they eat lots of seaweed. Okay? So those are protective foods. Yeah.
Uh, sorry, so estrogen, what kind of pills? You mean, you mean the um, aromatase inhibitor? Like Femara? Yes. That's right. Okay, okay, let me answer that. Thank you for the question. Um, so women who've had breast cancer, if that breast cancer was estrogen receptor positive when it was diagnosed, it means that estrogen is one of the things that increases the growth of that cancer or could increase the growth of that cancer. So in order to prevent a recurrence, you want to block estrogen. And there's two ways that it's done in the medical field. In a premenopausal women, women are given tamoxifen. And tamoxifen does what the soy does. It attaches to the receptor so that your body's estrogen can't attach. But it also causes possibly liver cancer and uterine cancer and blood clots and strokes. And these two big studies show that the soy worked better than the tamoxifen. And the soy doesn't cause uterine cancer and strokes. So my thing would, would be, why don't we skip the tamoxifen and just use the 11 grams of soy? Okay, postmenopausal women sometimes are given tamoxifen, and sometimes they're given a different drug called Femara, uh, which is an aromatase, or Arimidex is the other name for it, which inhibits uh, an, um, an enzyme called aromatase. So in postmenopausal women, what happens is we have fat cells, so our ovaries no longer make estrogen after menopause, and that's why the vaginal dryness, and that's why the skin gets more wrinkled, and your sexual energy goes down to zip, and you know, all these horrible things start happening. <laughs> and, uh, but what happens is your adrenal glands make a hormone called androstenedione, which goes into your fat cells, and then the, an enzyme called aromatase converts that hormone to estrogen. So you can, um, so it blocks that, that enzyme aromatase. So then those women have next to no estrogen, and that can dramatically reduce the risk of recurrence of breast cancer. However, because their estrogen levels are so low, it also can increase osteoporosis and loss of bone density. So my, uh, I think, you know, I'm not, I don't suggest that people, I, I mean, I work with the medical profession. I don't think that every woman with breast cancer should just use naturopathic medicine. And I prefer Arimidex or Femara much more than Tamoxifen. I think it's a better drug and it doesn't cause cancer. You know, tamoxifen causes cancer. Why would we do that? But the aromatase inhibitors don't cause cancer, but we have to be careful to do our best to protect the bones. So then you would take 5,000, 10,000 international units of vitamin D a day. You make sure you have a, a highly absorbable calcium supplement you take and magnesium for your bones. You can use uh, something called AB's Alba which is the bud of the fir tree that helps calcium get into the bones. It's called a gemotherapy. Either Unda is one company that makes it, or Herbal Gems is another company, but it incre increases bone density. You can take strontium. ABES, A-B-I-E-S, ALBA, A-L-B-A. And osteoporosis is also a disease of excess acidity. So as we get older, especially if we're not on a plant-based diet or if we're eating a lot of grains, the body gets more acidic. And what do we do to buffer that? We take the calcium out of our bones to decrease that acidity. And so another great thing to do is to take some sort of alkalinizing formula. I often give my patients a mixture, I call it alkaline powder, it's 30% um, sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. You can get a, a pharmacy to make this up. 30% sodium bicarbonate, 30% potassium bicarbonate, 26% calcium carbonate, 16% magnesium carbonate. You take a half teaspoon twice a day, and that alkalinizes the body and goes a long way to protect your bone density. Okay. 
30% sodium bicarbonate, 30% potassium bicarbonate, 26% calcium carbonate, 16% magnesium carbonate. Half a teaspoon in a little water twice a day between meals, because those are the alkaline minerals that we need. And if you have enough of those alkaline minerals, you don't need to lose the calcium from your, from your bones to buffer the excess acidity in the body. And then you can also look at your foods and which are the most alkaline foods. Spinach is the most alkaline vegetable, so a lot of steamed spinach. Um, avocados are fairly alkaline. You know, you can get, look at a chart. And the most acid-forming foods, the biggest one is cheese and meat, and then the grains. So you've got to get rid of the cheese and the meat and decrease the grain a little bit, increase the legumes, okay? And increase the vegetables, yes. Spirulina is very alkaline, yeah. Anything green is very alkaline. Um, and if one is supplementing with calcium, shouldn't they also be supplementing with K2? Uh, yeah, or, or what I recommend, okay, here's another tip, vitamin D. So the vitamin D usually has K2 in it. We all need vitamin D. Canadians have extremely low vitamin D levels. If your vitamin D levels are optimal, your breast cancer risk goes down 60%. 60% reduction in breast cancer if your vitamin D levels are optimal. So when you get your vitamin D levels tested, that it should be between 150 and 180. Sometimes it's 21, you know, or 79 or something like that. So 150 to 180. And for us in Canada, my, my average patient needs at least 5,000 international units of vitamin D a day, and some people need 10,000. And then Thorne Research. Thorne has a beautiful vitamin D. Uh, in glass, with a glass dropper, with a K2 in it, and one drop is a thousand. So five drops of that a day gives you your D3 and your K2. Okay? So that's how I deal with that. Thorn, T H O R N E, Thorn Research Vitamin D3 with K2. One drop is a thousand, so five drops a day is your 5,000. If we all did that, uh, the Canadian breast cancer rates would go down. <laughs> and as soon as that information was, was scientifically proven, within months, women had to pay for their vitamin D to be tested. Do you remember that? Does anyone remember that? It, was, it used to be part of OHIP. You could get your vitamin D tested every year. As soon as that information came out and how protective it was, you started to have to pay for, yeah, you to have to pay for it. No, it was like ridiculous. So anyhow, get your doctors to test that once a year. You have to, once a year, test your vitamin D. Yes? It is still covered by only if you were diagnosed Yes. I know, I know. But that's not going to tell you about breast cancer risk, you know? If we wanted to be proactive to reduce the biggest disease in women on the planet, we would test this every year starting at the age of 20, especially in countries that aren't beside the equator. Okay, yes. Uh, I like Bone Sure. Yeah, Bone Sure by Biomed, because the calcium is made from algae. So it's calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D in there, and I think there's boron in there as well. Boron, not for people with breast cancer, though, because the boron increases estrogen. So if you've had breast cancer, Avoid boron, even though it increases your bone density, you can't use it with breast cancer, you shouldn't. Would this be okay with somebody who has a parathyroid issue where they extreme I think so. To ask the, to, to tell them to check with the doctor, but that's a good one. Another one that's really well absorbed is the one by Flora, the liquid. So if you're older and you know your absorption isn't good, you could do the Flora liquid, Salus liquid Calmeg, S-A-L-U-S, Salus liquid Calmeg. That's really well absorbed. And then uh, AOR has been bone basics. It's another good one. So you need if osteopenia. You would probably want to go to 1,500 milligrams a day or 1,000 to 1,500. But the nice thing about the bone sure is because it's a food source, it's not going to build up in your arteries. Right? Yes. D3 plus K2. No, no. No, it's just another vitamin. It's not potassium. 
It's a vitamin, K2 is another vitamin that helps the absorption of calcium. That's it, it's vitamin D plus K. Yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But potassium also is a symbol K, but it's not potassium. You just you got a little more. Okay. The grains are uh, quinoa. Let me just think about it. No, it's, it's a glycemic anise. Uh, millet is not. Uh, millet is alkaline. Oats are very good for you, but they're quite acidic. So you have to buffer it. So if you're going to eat oats, also eat spinach, you know, or take more of the alkaline powder. It's, we want to check your pH of your urine and saliva and see where it's at, and then do what you need to do to get it between 6.8 and 7.2. No, quinoa is, I think, acid. Millet, I think, is the only one that's alkaline in terms of grains. Yes? Uh, so, with IVF, if you take a lot of drugs like Humira, yeah. what would be the effects for cancer? What's the way to detox from the drugs? Okay, so the, thanks for that great question. So, one of the things we want to be able to do well is to metabolize estrogen well. So, with the IVF, they're giving you a lot of drugs, including um, drugs that increase estrogen. So um, you want to help your liver to metabolize not only estrogen, but other hormones and environmental chemicals. So this is kind of a must. So I'm going to give you a little package for the liver, OK? So whether you have ovarian cysts, uterine fibroids, PMS, uh, breast cysts, breast cancer, this is a good little package to support your liver's ability to break down estrogen. So you ready? I'm going to go quick. Um, a B-complex. And my choice would be AOR, advanced B-complex, three of them in the morning, okay? Magnesium, we've already talked about that. Magnesium glycinate, 400 to 800 milligrams, depending on how well you sleep. And acetylcysteine, NAC, helps your liver uh, detox environmental chemicals as well as hormones, 500 milligrams one to three times a day alpha lipoic acid alpha lipoic acid it's an antioxidant that supports liver detoxification helps preventing cancers alpha lipoic acid uh, indole 3 carbonyl or you could eat sauerkraut or coleslaw so indole 3 carbonyl is really high in the raw brassicas especially cabbage so we all want some cabbage and uh, 400 milligrams a day, that's usually one capsule of indole 3 carbonyl or DIM, D-I-M. Sometimes they're mixed together, they're almost the same thing, indole 3 carbonyl or DIM. So that helps the liver deal with estrogen in, in particular um, and break it down. And then uh, rosemary. If you, one of the best things we could be doing is to drink rosemary tea every day. So rosemary supports the liver in um, breaking down estrogen into the healthy forms. It also is an antioxidant, and it's also strongly anti-cancer. It contains something called ursolic acid, which helps to kill uh, breast cancer cells and prostate cancer cells. So rosemary is one of the wonderful herbs for women's health. Somebody asked about the breast massage oil. So while I'm talking about breast cancer, uh, certain oils and essential oils kill breast cancer cells. So another thing we could do is massage our breasts, breasts with these oils to help deter the possibility of cancer. So the pomegranate oil, it's not an essential oil, that would be your carrier oil. So pomegranate oil would be the base, okay? You can order that from New Directions Aromatics. It's hard to get it otherwise. New Directions Aromatics. It's an online, you can order it online. They sell essential oils. And then in that, the, the strongest essential oil that protects the breasts is thyme, okay? Thyme. Lemon also is one, chamomile is the other, and cinnamon. So you put those four essential oils, thyme, lemon, chamomile, cinnamon, in a base of pomegranate seed oil as the carrier, and massage your breasts every night with that. Just rub them on your breasts. 
and that would be the, bre the best uh, oil I, that I know of anyhow to help deter breast cancer based on how they kill breast cancer cells. Would that be used for fibroids as well? No, no. Fibroids, you'd have to do something different. Um, that's specifically for killing breast cancer cells, okay? Uh, for fibroids, best thing is black cohosh. Also for menopausal hot flashes. Anybody need something for hot flashes? Okay. So fibroids, black cohosh is an herb that beautifully shrinks fibroids. So use the black cohosh plus all those things I said for your liver. Okay? So the black cohosh, one teaspoon twice a day of the tincture. For hot flashes in women, you're going to have 80% success with a tincture made out of three herbs. It's 50% black cohosh and 25% astragalus and 25% schizandra, S-C-H-I-Z-A-N-D-R-A. -A. Want to hear that again? So the hot flash tincture. So I, I make this and they fly off the shelf in my office. Is 50% black cohosh, 25% astragalus, which is an immune booster as well, and 25% schizandra. And schizandra is great for the liver, and great for the adrenal glands, as well as it reduces hot flashes. And then you do a teaspoon twice a day of that, and usually the hot flashes are much lower in about two weeks, and then they eventually go away. Okay? And that's very beneficial. Yes? No. The hot flashes are, uh, uh, maybe, actually, because it's, the, it's how the hypothalamus is interpreting what's going on in your life. They're much worse with stress and hot drinks and spicy food and all that. It could be partially adrenal, but it's also, it's how stressed you are. And so relaxation, that left nostril breathing is going to help the hot flashes too. You just kind of chill, right? Yes? 400 milligrams. Yeah, so endometriosis, that little package, a vegan diet, and, and a treat for candida. Candida. So you can use grapefruit seed extract or caprylic acid or get the um, New Roots has the candy gone, C-A-N-D-I gone. Uh, use that. But I've treated many people with endometriosis, spectacular results with a vegan diet and that it's estrogen, right? So you've got to bring the estrogen right down. And the other thing, so we talked about the liver breaking down estrogen, now you need to eliminate the estrogen. So you have to have three bowel movements a day, okay? 40 grams of fiber. You've got to get that estrogen out of your, out of your bowels and that would be three bowel movements a day. So how are you going to do that? One cup of beans, two tablespoons of flax seeds, two tablespoons of chia seeds, and one tablespoon twice a day of psyllium seed powder, if that agrees with you, with tons of water. And that will pull the estrogen out through your stools, and then you drink three liters of water a day, and then that helps you pee the excess estrogen out, as well as the environmental toxins, okay? And then everybody take a probiotic for your gut health. A probiotic, at least 10 billion of a good probiotic. Okay, yes? Milk thistle is fabulous for the liver. You could use milk thistle too, for sure. I think our time is up, but any, any last questions? Yes. Go ahead. You can if you really work hard at it, like uh, you know, broccoli and parsley and kale, the greens mostly for the calcium and sesame seeds. But I think most people need a supplement. In a supplement? Depending on how much you're getting in your food, either between 500 and 1,000 milligrams of calcium. Okay. Thank you, everybody. You can come up if you have more questions. I think there's new people that want to come in here, and I really appreciate your attention. All the best to you.